Hey, this is John with uh, Forward Talk, and I wanted to come to you guys today and talk to you about a subject that's very important to me. Uh, but before we do, I want to ask you to take the opportunity to, to, to subscribe to the channel. Um, our next level, I think, is 700 subscribers. But the ultimate goal that we're trying to get to is uh, 1,000 subscribers. So please help us get to that goal. I think about 70% of the people who watch uh, the Forward Talk videos are not subscribed. So we have plenty of room to grow. So if you're watching this video, please take the opportunity right now to hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell. Also, we want to ask you if, if any of the videos that we have done has been a blessing to you to please consider supporting the channel financially. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, here, uh, church planting, um, just a lot of areas. And so if this has been a blessing to you in any way, please consider supporting the channel financially. There will be opportunities uh, in the show notes, links for ways that you can give. Also, if you want to uh, support the channel in another way, you can do so by purchasing books that we have written. Um, one of the books that I wrote a number of years ago uh, was Are You a Christian? Uh, Redefining Apostolic. This is a book on Christian liberty. Um, I think it's very important. Um, it's it's becoming uh, increasingly important to me as the years go by. Also, an introduction to divorce and remarriage, a theology of healing after heartbreak. If you have experienced divorce, if you know someone who has experienced divorce, this book is a great uh, a great book to minister to them. And for those of you that are familiar with the channel, familiar with my life and ministry, you know that I'm divorced and am remarried. And so this is not just theology for me. This is lived experience. And so take the opportunity. Uh, if you'd like to support the ministry in this way, you can do so. All right. Um, at this point, we are going to get into the content that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the oneness of God. It's a very important topic to me and has been for a long time. But in this video and perhaps a number of videos um, uh, in a series, I want to talk about it from a perspective that we don't normally talk about it. We don't normally talk about the oneness of God from the perspective of it being a commandment. We normally talk about it in an us versus them, a oneness versus Trinitarian or a oneness versus Unitarian uh, idea. But uh, Jesus says in Mark 12, 28 to 30, that the oneness of God is the first commandment. And of course, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is where we get the foundation for the oneness of God. The oneness of God is a commandment and not just a creed. A creed is what one is to believe, but a commandment is what one is to do. But the oneness of God is not only a commandment, it is the first commandment. But by first commandment, he doesn't simply mean the first commandment chronologically in an order of commandments, because there were commandments given before, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So it's what Matthew twenty two thirty eight 38 calls the great commandment. So it is the first hierarchically, not chronologically. It is the first in order of importance. Or as Matthew 23, 23 says, uh, the weightier matters of the law. Now, this doesn't mean that there are unimportant commandments, com commandments of God that are meaningless. No, it just means that some commandments carry greater weight than other commandments, but all of the commandments of God are important. Both the Old and New Covenants support the idea of degrees of sin or uh, levels of importance of commandments, and violation for certain commandments under the Old Testament uh, were punishable by death, while others were not. And there were different um, offerings that were offered for different kinds of of sins in the Old Testament. Not all sins demanded the same kind of offering. There were three degrees of sin in Jewish thought. The first degree of sin was uh, sin that was committed ignorantly against um, a divine command without knowledge of the existence or the meaning of that command. The second degree of sin was a breach of a minor commandment committed with full knowledge of the existence and the nature of that commandment. And the third and ultimate level was an evil that was presumptuous and rebe a rebellious act against God. 
And so these are the <clears throat> three dimensions of transgressions or sins against God. Under the old covenant, all sins required atonement, but some sins were an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 6 talks about seven things that the Lord hates. Certainly God hated more than seven things, but these seven things were at the at the top of God's list of things that he hated. Now, uh, there aren't just degrees of sin in terms of consequences from a human perspective. No, this verse in Proverbs says that these are seven things that the Lord hates. So there are degrees of sins from God's perspective. The New Testament also affirms this idea of degrees of sin. For example, Luke 12, 47, there was a servant that knowingly rebelled and did not do the will of his Lord. This servant would receive uh, many stripes. An another servant ignorantly violated the will of his Lord and would receive, according to Luke 12, 48, few stripes. And so uh, to borrow Jesus' words from Luke 12, 48, for unto whom much is given of him shall much be required. The Lord in this story, of course, is the Lord, and we are the servants. The Lord himself will punish the disobedient servants by degrees. It is certain that the degree of punishment in this text is from God's perspective. However, it is debatable whether this text refers to judgment against Jerusalem or eternal punishment. Um, uh, it, is, it is possible that in principle Christ had both in mind, but, but the point is, is that that the punishment was a, from a divine source, and it had varying degrees of severity. The Apostle John also taught there's a sin that is not unto death, and there is a sin that is unto death, First John 5 and verse number 16. And whatever that means, uh, we're not going to get into that at this point, just the fact that there's a sin that is not unto death and a sin that is unto death. And of course, Matthew 12 and verse number 31 talks about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost as a sin that shall not be forgiven in this world or the world to come, while all other sins will be forgiven. I have another video on that called Refuting the Fear, You Did Not Blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So if you want to see a video uh, on that topic, particularly, you can go watch that, that video. Um, so there's all kinds of questions surrounding that text, but that's not the point here. Simply to say that there are some sins that will be forgiven and other sins that will not be forgiven. If Scripture attributed equal significance to all God's commandments, then the punishments for violating them would all be equal. However, God justly punishes some sin sins in direct proportion to the importance of the law violated. Uh, also, secular culture mirrors the scriptural scriptural idea of proportional punishment. One does not get uh, the death penalty for littering, but he may for murder. This is because murder is a more malicious crime than littering. And this is only one um, example, of course. Much of the law in Western culture is uh, based upon a Judeo-Christian ethic uh, and that is the foundation of many of our laws. Now, where does the first commandment fit into the hierarchy of biblical commands? The Shema is the most important of all the commandments and the doctrines. It is the first commandment. Consequently, it carries with it the highest penalty for its violators. Jesus said that except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins, John 8 and verse number 24. Eternal life is dependent upon knowing the one true God as revealed in Jesus Christ, John 17 and verse number 3. To recognize God in Christ is the highest revelation of God, but to reject God in Christ is the highest revolt against God, 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, and then 2 John, verse 9. To reject God in Christ is such a revolt against God that it is the only thing that the New Testament explicitly calls Antichrist. 1 John 2, 22, 4, 3, 2 John, verse 7. 
Um, this is the spirit of Antichrist that you heard John said that should come, and even now already is in the world. What is the spirit of Antichrist? Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is the Antichrist. It's not Nikolai Carpathia. It's not uh, the the uh, the Antichrist is not some dramatized version of eschatology that you have probably heard. John tells us exactly what Antichrist is. Antichrist is the rejection that Jesus Christ uh, is come in the flesh. So just how important is the Shema? How important is Hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one Lord? It is called the first commandment, brothers and sisters, because it is the first commandment. It is the first commandment, and because there is a first commandment, there is a second commandment. Matthew or Mark 12, 31 says, the second commandment is like, namely unto the first commandment, and that is thou shalt love the, thy neighbor as thyself. And there is no other commandments that are greater than these. So the first and the second commandment are alike, but how are they alike? They are alike and they are they alike in that they are equal in every way? No. They are alike in that both require love. The first commandment is to love God, and the second commandment is to love our neighbor, who is God, who is created in God's image, just like we are. It is in this way that the first and the second commandment are alike. I got another deep revelation. Jesus called the second commandment the second commandment because it is the second commandment. It is not the tied for first commandment. It is the second commandment. In hierarchy of commandments, to love the one Lord of the Shema is the first and the greatest of all the commandments. The first commandment is the greatest commandment because the second commandment is dependent upon it and is powerless apart from it. This is true because man, apart from the love of God, is incapable of loving faithfully and fully loving his neighbor as himself. In fact, man cannot truly love himself apart from the love of God. Vertical love is necessary before we can actualize horizontal love or love for oneself and neighbor. Therefore, the first and the second commandment are interrelated and interdependent, but they are not co-equal in every way. Notice what Jesus said to a tempting Pharisee in Matthew 27 or 22 verses 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might or mind. This is the first and great commandment. First and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Prophets, according to Jesus, all the law and the prophets hang on the first and the second commandments. Imagine that you have fastened two screws, representing the one representing the first commandment, another representing the second commandment. And imagine also that the weight of all the rest of the law and the prophets were hanging on those two screws, the first commandment and the second commandment, as like chains on um, a port swing hanging from hooks above. Hypothetically, what would happen if the second commandment came unfastened? The entire weight of the law and the prophets would then hang on the first commandment, and the first commandment would be strong enough to hold the law and the prophets until one could refasten the second commandment. But hypothetically, what do you think would happen if somehow the first commandment was unfastened and the entire weight of the law and the prophets were cut to come and hang on the second commandment. The second commandment would immediately bend and quickly break under the weight of the law and the prophets. This means that we cannot love our neighbor as we ought to if we do not love the one Lord of the first commandment. We can only love our neighbor selfishly Apart, we cannot love our neighbor selfishly apart from the selfless love of the one Lord of the Shema. Yet if we love the one Lord of the first commandment, we will come to love 
our neighbor as ourselves. This is why they are the first and the second commandment, respectively. Therefore, the Shema is the foundational doctrine of Scripture. The other doctrines of Scripture do not matter if the Shema is untrue. The truth of every other doctrine of Scripture depends on the truth of the Shema. The Shema is the fountainhead and bedrock of all doctrine and theology. The Scriptures themselves depend upon the Shema, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. Justification depends on the Shema, Romans 3 and verse number 30. Sanctification depends on the Shema. And these are just three examples that we could uh, that we are using, and we could multiply those examples. Firstly, let's discuss how the scriptures themselves depend on the truthfulness of the Shema and the accuracy and the authority of the the scriptures that necessarily depend on the existence and oneness of God. Second Timothy three sixteen: All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness. The truthfulness of Scripture depends on God's existence. The Scripture depends on God's existence because they claim of themselves that they are God breathe, thea panustos. If God does not exist, then logically and necessarily, the Scriptures would not exist and they would be untrue. The truth of Scripture, Old and New Testaments, alike also depend on the oneness of God and not merely his existence. Ultimately, the oneness of God is the only defense that we have against other religions and their holy books. If the Shema is untrue, then other gods exist. And if other gods exist, then we must give equal credence to those gods, their religions, and their creeds. The reason I reject the Quran as a source of divine authority is and revelation is because I reject Allah as God. The reason I reject Allah as God is because I believe in Yahweh and his personal revelation in and as Jesus Christ as the only true God, 1 John 5 and verse number 20. Secondly, let's just discuss briefly how the doctrine of justification depends on the Shema. Justification is God's judicial declaration of a person being just in and through faith in Christ. If the Shema is untrue, then we must ask the question, justified before whom and by whom? If the Shema is un untrue and other gods exist, then justification becomes a matter of multiple choice where there are no wrong answers. One becomes his or her own God if justification is merely a matter of choosing which God's terms for justification he or she will accept. Consequently, if the Shema is true, then one must humbly bow before the one true God and seek his grace and mercy. And I will discuss the relationship between justification and the oneness of God more later. Thirdly and lastly, the doctrine of justification depends on the Shema in much the same way that justification does. The sh if the Shema is untrue and there's more than one God, then we must ask, to ask sanctified unto whom and by whom. Sanctification and the oneness of God find their roots in the Old Testament. God revealed himself to Israel as a jealous God based on the Shema. Exodus 34, 14, for thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. The one true God commanded his people to worship no other God. He and he alone was God and therefore had sanctified his people unto himself alone. Therefore, sanctification is necessarily monotheistic. The New Testament reiterates this principle. <clears throat> and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be you separate. Saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians six sixteen to 18. The oneness of God is the basis for sanctification in both the Old and New Testaments. According to Paul, we are to be holy because the Holy One set us apart unto himself by his Spirit. Sanctification is superficial if the Shema 
is untrue. Can you see how the oneness of God then is more than just a fight that we perpetuate with Trinitarians, Unitarians for decades in public debate? I'm not suggesting that we stop debating the nuances of the nature of God. I am suggesting, however, that the oneness of God is more than a matter of debate, but a matter of devotion. Let me say that again. The oneness of God is more than just a matter of, de of debate. It is a matter of devotion. The Shema must be the basis for all that we believe and practice as Christians. Therefore, the Shema is more than something I am to believe. It is something that I am to do, Deuteronomy 6.4, to keep, Deuteronomy 6.2, and to observe, Deuteronomy 6 and verse number 3. So the question that we must ask ourselves then, since the, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is a commandment, how is one to do, keep, and observe, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord? Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 gives us some insight into how we are to do and not just believe the Shema. The Shema should affect every aspect of my life. Not only does the oneness of God affect every doctrine of Scripture, it also affects every detail of life. Get that. Not only does the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, affect every doctrine of Scripture, it should also affect every detail of life. Why? Because it's a commandment. It's what I am supposed to do. It's what I am supposed to keep. It is what I am supposed to observe. And so for those who claim to be oneness, for those who claim to be oneness, the oneness of God is not just a doctrine. It's not just a theology that you use to beat up everybody else that disagrees with you over the nuances and the language of the nature of God. Uh, oneness versus Trinity, oneness versus Unitarian. Rather, the word of God or the oneness of God is a lifestyle. The oneness of God is the is a way in which you ought to conduct yourself and how you ought to behave in the world. All right, this is just the first part of uh, a tremendous amount of information that I want to share with you. Uh, again, if this episode has been um, a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel. If you don't support the channel financially, uh, whether by uh, contributions that are listed, uh, link, contribution links that are listed in the show notes, or by purchasing one of my books, please support the channel by subscribing. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this episode. God bless you in Jesus' name.